welcome back to Code Report. I'm your host, Connor Herbstra, and this is the show where we review the contests from the last week from four of the top competitive programming contest websites. So let's take a look at what happened over the last week. So this week we had three contests, two from Code Forces, one on Friday morning and one on Saturday morning. And of course, we finished the week off with the weekly leak code contest, Contest 68. Unfortunately, problem B from Code Forces round 457, the contest that took place on Friday, was defective, so that contest ended up being unrated. Here are the top 10 leaderboards from each of the contests, notably uh, UE taking the top spot in the Leak Code Contest 68. And the problems we're going to be covering this week are uh, problem 1 from Code Forces round 457, problem 3 from Leak Code Contest 68. And I'm going to be releasing a follow-up video to cover problem C from round, Code Forces round 458. So for problem one, uh, Code Forces round 57, we have the problem Jamie and Alarm Snooze. So this problem essentially gives you a, a time given in the format two digits for the hour and two digits for the minute, and also a snooze time K. And the problem states that uh, Jamie needs to wake up at a given time that's given to you, and it asks for you to find what's the minimum number of snoozes such that the first time the alarm goes off, it's at a lucky number. And a lucky number is defined as uh, a time stamp having the digit seven in it. Um, so let's take a look at a couple examples and it'll be a little bit more clear what this problem is asking for. So there's basically three, sort of 3.5 cases that we need to worry about. Uh, the simplest case is case one. Uh, so for example, if we're given the timestamp uh, 1020 uh, and the snooze time is three minutes, uh, the answer is one because the minimum number of times he could snooze it such that uh, the time that the alarm initially goes off contains a seven in it would be 1017, which is one snooze time before the time he needs to get out of bed, which is at 1020. Um, so you can see you just subtract uh, three minutes from 1020 and you end up with 1017. So that's the easiest case. Basically, when the number of minutes uh, that we have is greater than the snooze amount, you can basically just subtract uh, the snooze time from the number of minutes. The second case is when we're going to have to wrap around uh, the zero uh, minute mark and decrease the hour as well. So for case two, our example is uh, 2002, uh, and our snooze time is seven minutes, and the answer is five. And you can see by looking at why uh, you keep on decrementing uh, 2002 by seven until you end up with uh, a timestamp that has a seven in it, which ends up being 1927. And so the first time that we, we uh, decrement seven from our timestamp, we have to also adjust the 20, uh, to uh, 19 and when we do this we also have to add 60 uh, to our minutes after decrementing it by the snooze time. Um, for case 3 it's similar to case 2 but this time we're wrapping around uh, the zero mark for the hour which means that uh, you can't ever have negative one hours when you have negative one you should reset that to uh, 23. Um, and sort of the, the case 3.5 is that uh, your timestamp already has a seven in it. That answer will be zero. But if you write your algorithm correctly, you shouldn't need to do anything for this. So let's take a look at the code. So the first thing that we've done at the top is uh, define a function called has seven, which takes uh, A and B. Uh, that can be the minute or the hours. It doesn't matter which way you pass them in. And all it does is use the modulus operator uh, mod 10 to get the last digit and checks whether it's equal to seven. Note that we don't need to worry about the first digit for the hour or for the minute because we know uh, there's no hour on the clock or minute on the clock that has a seven in the leading digit. Um, so once we have this function, we can come down to our uh, num snoozes function and all we need is a while loop that says while our time uh, doesn't have a seven in it, um, do some operations on the hour and the minute. So the first if statement is for case one. This is where if our minutes is greater than our uh, greater or equal to our snooze amount, we just uh, reduce the minutes uh, by that amount. Uh, case two 
is uh, for uh, in the first two lines in the else statement. That's when we have to decrease uh, the hour as well as the minute. Uh, so you can see we're just doing a minus minus on the hour and we're doing a, a plus 60 uh, minus the snooze amount so that you don't end up with a negative minute uh, when reversing the minute hand. And case three is uh, caught by this last if statement where if your hour uh, gets set to negative one by the line above, uh, by the post, uh, post, post decrement, um, you reset the hour to 23. Um, and every single time you perform these operations, that's considered uh, a snooze. So we have a counter called C. So you just do a, a, a plus plus on the C, a post increment, and you continue this loop until the uh, has seven function is satisfied. And at the end, you just return it. So the last thing to uh, do with this problem is look at the complexity. Um, so you might be thinking that due to the while loop, it's uh, a linear uh, runtime uh, O of N, but that's actually not correct because uh, your input doesn't impact, it, it, it does have a relationship uh, with how long or how many loops your while loop is gonna loop for. Um, but there is, there is a maximum uh, a constant basically that you know uh, the loop will never go past. So there's a worst case, you know, when your hour is set to maybe five o'clock, uh, you know, and you have uh, two minutes as your snooze. So it's gonna, you know, loop all the way back around until it hits seven. So maybe six o'clock. So that's your worst case and you're never gonna have anything worse than that based on your input. So uh, it actually turns out that this algorithm uh, runs in constant time. And I can see I missed a slide there talking about how case 3.5 is caught just by uh, your first statement. So if it already has a seven in it, it'll just skip everything in the loop. So moving on to problem three from Leak Code Contest 68. Uh, the problem states, given an array that is a permutation of zero, one to uh, a dot length minus one. So basically zero to n minus one uh, rearranged somehow. Uh, we split the array into some number of chunks or partitions and individually sort each chunk. After conca concatenating them, uh, the result equals the sorted array. And so the question asks, what is the maximum number of partitions that we could have chosen? So let's take a look at a couple examples and uh, look at the algorithm that we're going to use. So the first two examples are provided to us by leak code, and I've added the third example because it demonstrates uh, the second step of our algorithm that we're going to need to use. So the two steps are step one, look for the index you need. So what does need mean? So if we think about the first partition, we know that in order for the final concatenated uh, array to be sorted, our first partition has to have the zero in it. Because if our first partition doesn't have the zero in it, that, mean the, that means the zero won't be in the, uh, the first index, uh, and so therefore it won't be sorted. So say you identify uh, that the first two elements of your array form partition one. Then the next index that you'll need for your second partition is going to be uh, two. Uh, because for the same reason that zero needed to be in our, our first partition, two needs to be in our second partition if your first partition has a length of two. Um, the second step that you need to do is to keep adding uh, or looping through your array until you have a complete consecutive partition. So this is after you found uh, the index uh, that you need in your partition. And that we'll, sh we'll see that with example three. So the way we're going to do this is by uh, using a data structure called a set. So there's two properties you need to know about a set. Uh, we're only needing one of them for this problem, but a set stores its elements in order, so they'll always be sorted. And a set also only ever has uh, one occurrence of a given element, so you'll never see duplicates in a set. Uh, we don't really need the second part, uh, but we, do, we definitely need the first. Um, so for our first example, we're gonna loop through, zero is the last element of the array, uh, so we're gonna end up with every single element in our uh, set, and then uh, we can check to see if that is a complete consecutive partition, uh, which it is. It, it is assorted and it doesn't skip any numbers. Uh, so the answer for example one will just be one. Uh, for example two, uh, we find uh, zero at the second element, uh, index one, and if we look at our set at that point of all the elements that we've added, uh, that is also a complete consecutive uh, partition as it uh, is 
sorted and it doesn't skip any numbers once again. And for example three, we find zero also at index one, the second element. But if we take a look at our set, it's not a complete consecutive partition uh, because it skips the number one. So we need to keep on uh, looping through our array until we end up with a complete consecutive partition. And if we loop to the next element, uh, then indeed we'll have a complete consecutive partition. So from here, for example, two and three, we just repeat this algorithm, noting that the index we're looking for, for example, two, or the element that we're looking for is the number two, and the element we're looking for, example, three, is three. So if we do that, uh, we're going to immediately find two in the next uh, element position, and for example, three, we're going to have to loop to the end. Uh, so of course, our set, for example, three is a complete consecutive partition, so we're done for this. And for example, two, if we keep on going, we'll find the three and the four right away. So the answer for that will end up being four partitions. So here's the code. I'm going to go through this quickly so that we can get to our linear solution to this problem. Uh, so at the top, we have a function uh, which tells us whether we have a complete consecutive partition. So if we pass in the set, and then we take a look at the maximum element. So s.rbegin returns you an iterator to uh, the last element. So if you need to iterate through a set from back to front, you can use rbegin uh, to do that. And when you do a plus plus, it moves backwards through the array. Uh, whereas sbegin uh, is more intuitive. It starts uh, from the beginning and goes to the end. Uh, and the asterisk in front of both of those is uh, dereferencing the iterator as the iterator is just a pointer. So if we take the maximum and the minimum uh, from our given set and add one to it because it's inclusive, if that's equal to the size of the set, then we know that we have a complete consecutive partition. So in the example, when we had zero and two uh, as our, our minimum and our maximum, but it wasn't complete a complete consecutive partition, uh, two minus zero plus one equals three. So that's saying if two is our maximum and zero is our minimum, we should have three elements in our set. But unfortunately at that point we only had two, uh, so that would return us false. So we can use that to check whether we have a complete consecutive uh, partition. And uh, then we move on to our, mar our max chunks to sorted function. Uh, we define our set at the top. Uh, it's empty at that point in time, and we need an index uh, starting at zero and then a count to count the number of partitions. So we'll use C for that. Um, and so we loop while I is less than uh, the size of our array. We initially set the uh, element that we're looking for finding equal to I, which is zero at this point, and then uh, our, our Boolean uh, called found to false, meaning that we haven't found that element. And then basically we have a, another loop that works inside with the first while loop that says while we haven't found it and it's not consecutive, consecutive our set, uh, continue to iterate. And as soon as we, on the first line of our while loop uh, here, uh, as soon as we find that element, we set found to true. So this condition will then pass. And then at that point, we're just adding elements to our set until we end up with a consecutive, uh, a complete consecutive partition. And once we uh, manage that, we uh, increment our count, we clear our set, and then we restart the algorithm. Um, and at that point, I will be equal to uh, the first element after uh, the elements that we've identified in the last partition. So the last thing to do with this algorithm is to look at the complexity. Uh, once again, similar to last week, although we have two while loops here, they're both using uh, the same in, uh, index. So this is actually only uh, linear, it's not n squared. And then uh, a property of insertions and retrievals from a set is that those are both done in uh, log n time. And that's nested inside our uh, linear loop. So in total, uh, the complexity of this algorithm is n log n. So let's move on to uh, the much simpler uh, but less intuitive uh, solution to this problem that can be written in much less code. So if we go back to our examples, uh, what we need to do to see the solution to this problem is create an array uh, where each element is equal to the maximum so far uh, that's found in the uh, subarray up until that point. So if we do that for each three of these examples, 
we end up with something like this. So because the maximum, for example, one is at uh, the first element, our whole array is just going to be equal to fours. Uh, whereas, for example, two, uh, one, one, two, three, four. So the only element that gets sort of overwritten is the second element, the zero. And uh, for example three, we end up with two, 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 four, four. So the maximum gets reset at the zero index and at the three index. So if we replace our original array with just an array of indexes, uh, zero, one, two, three, four, and then the trick is to see this pattern that the number of times that the maximum matches uh, the index uh, is also equal to the solution. Um, so it, it basically is a quicker way of doing our previous solution without keeping track of the set. And so this can be implemented with the following code. Uh, it's basically one while loop. We store uh, a variable m for our maximum and c for our count. So for each iteration of the while loop, we just reset our maximum variable m if we have to. And at any point, so the second line of the uh, for loop, at any point when m is equal to the index, we just do a plus plus on our count and then return that. And of course, this algorithm is linear. So taking a look at what's coming up next week, we've got three contests, uh, two on Thursday, a top coder SRM 728, and then a three day long hacker rank hiring contest, which starts at 10.30 p.m. and ends on Sunday evening at the same time. And then we'll finish the week off, of course, with our weekly lead code contest. That's all for this week. Look out for the video on problem C from Code Forces Contest 458. It'll be out in the next couple days. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.